when I don't feel like I'm a success or I don't feel like I have that, we, we get these anxious nerves inside and then we, we could only give out what we have inside. So that comes out and the world's a mirror, so it reflects back to you anxiety and nerves and anxiousness. But when you got good in you because the way you frame up what you see and how you're experiencing life, well, well, good comes out and the world's a mirror to you. So I get to live in a really cool world because I live internally in a really cool world. I love the confidence in that question because because every time I ask it, I'm like, do you consider yourself? You just gave the definition. Do you consider yourself successful? And you know, about half the people are like you, like absolutely, hundred percent, yes. And the other half are like, well, you know, kind of. And but most of them come to the point where they're like, I'm aiming at it. Like it's a fluid thing. It's success changes from time to time based on some circumstances, but it's mainly a mindset thing. So I'm glad to hear your confidence in that. Some happen, yeah. In today's ultra-competitive business world, being a successful entrepreneur or business owner can be very challenging. Fortunately, contemporary times have blessed us with resources for tackling those challenges and getting us to success more quickly than we could have imagined. Welcome to The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan, a podcast that explores how the world's most powerful entrepreneurs grow incredible companies. This podcast looks at the five keys to unlocking success as an entrepreneur. A successful educator turned entrepreneur, Jason's mission is to use his gifts of teaching and leadership to help others get the results they want out of life. Join Jason every week and learn the keys to grow a truly successful business. Welcome back to The Root of All Success. I'm the real Jason Duncan, and we've got a treat for you today. We're actually on location in California shooting a bunch of episodes this week with some amazing, super successful entrepreneurs because that you, that's what you've come to expect from the root of all success. So we've got a great guest for you today. We're actually in our Airbnb. We're actually in the city of Citrus Heights, California, just north of Sacramento. And uh, we're recording a couple episodes here. And then we're recording some more episodes later this week in uh, Lincoln, California at another location. Then we'll be in San Diego. So a lot of cool stuff. And all these episodes will be released back to back. So you'll get to see what it's like for us to go on the road. So thank you for, for joining us. If you're listening on on any podcast player, I want to, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much for listening. As a podcast host, it is it's it makes me, I, I, I know my guest knows this too. It's like to know people listen to you, there's, there's such a, a pride in knowing that you're delivering great content that's valuable. So thank you. I appreciate you listening. Thank you for sending me messages and let me know how much you like the show. And if you haven't left a five-star review, I would really appreciate that. One other guest I had on the show said that reviews, five-star reviews specifically, are like currency for podcast hosts. It's the way that we get to the top of the list so that other people can hear us and we get more opportunity to interview great people and deliver great content. So if you don't mind leaving a five-star review, I would really appreciate that. The other thing is if you haven't listened or watched this on YouTube, you're really missing out. You should go to youtube.com slash C slash The Real Jason Duncan, and you can, uh, you can actually subscribe to the playlist for The Root of All Success and watch these. Because today, you can see, if you're watching on camera, you see me on camera right now, and I'm sitting in this, in this Airbnb here in California, and then in just a couple of minutes, you're going to see my guests, and you get to see this cool location. So watch it on YouTube. It's at youtube.com slash C for channel slash The Real Jason Duncan. Today's episode sponsor is One Nine. That's O N E N I N E. One Nine, and I you've probably uh, not heard of them, but I want to tell you how much as an entrepreneur you need them. Um, you've probably had this experience where you had your website not completely up to date. Your web developer, whoever it was that you got to design your website, is M I A. You can't find him. Maybe he's out of business. Maybe he's just ducking your calls. You need to add <clears throat> add something to your website. You need to update it, you need to change it, an offer, you need to do a contact form, and you don't have anybody to handle that. It's not necessarily just getting it designed from the beginning, but it's getting it all updated. Well, that is exactly what One9 specializes in. You can go to managemywebsites.com slash root, managemywebsites.com slash root for a special offer where for a small flat monthly fee, they can take over the management of your current site. They can host it, They'll update it. They'll take care of everything you need. As a matter of fact, I got a message from Steven on the team over there who manage, who's kind of my project manager, handles all my sites, and gave me a list of the five things that they updated over the weekend because things just needed to be updated. They take 
it, they take care of it. So if you need help with your website, and you know you do, go to managemywebsites.com slash root for a special offer where you can save over $600 a year on the cost of their services. And it's, it's fantastic. So Nathan Ruff's the owner of One Nine. Love that guy. He was actually a former guest on my show. So go take a look at managemywebsites.com slash root. All right, let's talk about, <clears throat> let's talk about today's guest. Um, you know, I get, I get to have some amazing conversations with people doing this show. And today, I'm really super excited about having this guy on the show today. He's a uh, former foster kid turned NFL athlete turned serial entrepreneur whose specialty is making shift happen. And I, I, I love how that, that, that just that little play on words, making shift happen. He's got a couple of great podcasts. Uh, one's called the uh, Shift Starter Podcast, which is a daily podcast he does just every day for just a short podcast to kind of get your day going. And then the Awe Shift Podcast, which is a longer form where he does interviews. And the guy is really infectious, like his attitude, his energy, his enthusiasm. And his story is where he kind of overcame 30 plus traumatic events in his life, going through lots of shifts in identity and mindset. And now he takes that to the world, to people like you and me. And he takes that concept of your identity shifting so that you can make the most out of your life. Because as he says, most of us are playing at a much lower level than we're capable of. And he uses psychology and technology and motivation and kind of puts all this stuff together so that he can get you to a better place. And we're going to talk about how he came up with that as a concept, how he's using that to make the world a better place. As a matter of fact, when he arrived this morning, as we were finalizing and getting everything set up, he did, a, he did a live with some of his people and I heard him and he was talking about some really cool stuff about uh, your plan, how you, how you go through life and how you plan things out. And the infectious attitude and energy that our guest has today is going to rub off on you. And I want to welcome to the show today, Mr. Anthony Trucks. Man, this is such an honor to have you on the show. I'm so glad that we got introduced, and I'm very honored that you drove up today. Yeah, you. man, I made it happen. They said good people find good people, and that, that drive, I mean, at one point, it was going to be a lot longer. When they called this morning, I was like, oh, it's shorter? <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah, so we were supposed to have it up in uh, another spot in uh, north of town, north, further north from here, but uh, something happened. I don't know what happened. But well, it worked out for me. Yeah. Well, the Airbnb's nice, man. It works out. Yeah, we got a ping pong table right over here. Yeah, we'll go play. I'll go beat you later if you want. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's up to you. It's not hard to do that. <laughs> so, Anthony, like making shift happen. I love it. I love that. I think the identity shift, you got the book coming out. So how did all this get started? As an entrepreneur who's taken this concept of sh mind shift and making shift happen, like where did that originate for you? I mean, well, there's a whole backstory I'm sure we'll get to, but it came to pass on an accident, which most great things I find do. I was sitting in a meeting, we were actually when Jackson Hole, Wyoming with a bunch of guys just all talking about business. And then at some point, somebody asked me a question about my business, which used to be trust your hustle. And uh, I ran through it and he goes, man, I, goes, I don't like it. I go, what do you mean don't like it? He goes, well, as I like it, there's a message and a messenger. The messenger is you. You could speak, talk, that's all great. He says, but if the message doesn't coincide and connect together, you lose the power of it. And he says, I, I don't think trust or hustle matches what I'm hearing from your life story. He says, what I want to know is how'd you go through all of that? How'd you navigate those different shifts of your identity to get to this room? And that was where the seed was planted and the, the concept of identity landed at that moment. And then it's been years of just digging into like textbooks and conversation and obviously looking at my life, other people's lives to figure like, oh, there's this golden thread that for some reason no one has kind of noticed that I could unpack and I could kind of codify and that's what I've done with it. So when that started, what, do you remember what year that conversation happened? That was, I want to say like April 2017. Wow, so yeah. not long ago. I mean, this is a relatively new concept. Well, but I, and I started in 2014, right? So I started the concept of what I do in 2014. I got into the realm, but I was doing this trust or hustle brand. The interesting thing, which is always interesting, is about 80% of what I'd been doing just kind of transitioned and married over to this stuff. It was no different. It was just the language around it was different. Because to like trust or hustle still is an internal thing. So like I, I didn't name an identity, but that's kind of what I was kind of going towards at the time without knowing it. So... I didn't have to change everything. Like I actually kind of carried some of the same structure, same methodology over, and it all just seemed to work out. So yeah, it's, it's, if you really want to go back, back, it's like 2014, so we're like seven-ish years into it. I think for, for me, and I, I know that there's probably listeners that would also identify with my, my, uh, my uh, curiosity, mm -hmm. is that 
the NFL part of that. Like, so how did that work out? Because you, you were in, in the NFL for a, a while, but that's a kind of a part of your story. But yeah. really, you're the guy you are today more than anything you've ever been is t- telling people how to make their shift happen. But yeah. where did the NFL play in that? Like, where did you go to college? How did you get in that? Yeah, yeah, I went to University of Oregon, uh, and I wasn't supposed to go to college. As a foster kid, like, you don't, that's not statistically in the cards. If you go to any prison in America, 75% of the inmates are former foster kids. So we're not statistically set up to do well. I think like half our homeless population or more, and then like less than 1% of us actually graduate from college. So numerically, college isn't in the cards. NFL is definitely not in the cards. But, but man, I went through that. And what I have garnered from those moments in time that I've brought forward are vastly more intangible than anything. Right, so it's uh, it's my ability to talk and banter because every day you're in you know conversation, talking crap back and forth, or being able to show up in the moments when you feel like I don't want to do anything else, but like you know you have extra, like to pull that out. The hard part is is most athletes they don't know how to take it from the physical standpoint and apply it to like the mental standpoint. So that took a few years, but to be honest, the way that I show up now, the life lessons I learned in the game of football, even well before the NFL, those have carried over amazingly into what I do now. And even the concept of it, like when I, when I lost the game, I lost myself because my identity was wrapped up in football. So even like the whole concept and segment of like 13 years of my life has led immensely to the, the understanding of how I can do what I do now and then also do it for other people. I didn't think about that, the identity of playing, of being a football player. And when you got injured, because I think your story was you got you had an injury it where did. you couldn't continue to play. Yep. And then you dealt with this identity, uh, what we call identity crisis. I did the, I had that same thing, and I know this show's not about me, but I think it's important to, to kind of give you perspectives that, you know, for a long time in my life, I was the president and CEO of Energy Lighting Services. That's what I did. And when I decided to exit without exiting, man, I, I had a major, like, five, probably five months of, yeah. like, how do I introduce myself to people? Like, yeah. what do I say? <laughs> yeah. I'm not the CEO anymore. I, yeah. Somebody else is handling that. How do I do that? So. I can sympathize with that because I dealt with that. I bet that was tough, though, because your identity was not only in something you did, but it was like a physical, like you yeah. kept your body in a certain shape, mm-hmm. mentally, physically. So how, how did you deal with that identity shift when you were no longer going to be an NFL athlete? The same everybody does. Wrong? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, it's not about you, but you are a human as am I. And these, these, are, not, these are not you know unique to us. I, no matter who you are, when you've been doing something for two, three, four, five years, right, plus you eventually have have poured so much into it that you're not just the person who does that thing, but you are that, right? So it's like, I'm not just out here boxing, I'm a boxer. You know, I'm not just out here, you know, doing parent stuff, I'm a mom, I'm a dad. And so for me, what happens is one day, at some point in time, we will wake up and whether by choice or by chance, right? Chance for my injury, by choice of I sold the business, right, I got out. You'll wake up and realize I'm not doing that thing and I can't. And then the question lays of, well, who am I? What do I do? Do I bring value to the world? And I think that's the heaviest question. And when I don't like I'm bringing value, it's like, well, why am I even doing anything? Why work hard? What's the, for football? Well, I'm not gonna play a game. Why work out? What's the point of that? You know, I, seriously, this is a common thought, by the uh-huh. way. Not, like, so it's like, why work out? And then for like, you know, you go to business, it's like, well, I don't know, I, I can work real hard. I'll be great in business. No, you won't. Like, you, you, you don't know anything about business. You just wanna work hard, right? So all these aspects are to tie in. And you eventually met with the fact of like, when I look in the mirror, Nobody cares, not even me. And so you go to this dark hole of trying to figure out, well, who am I? And if you don't rebuild an identity somewhere, you're left with this gaping hole forever. What creates our identity in your mind? Like, what is that? Is it what we do? Is it how we feel? What we think? Is it, is it culture? Is it nature, nurture? What creates the identity in someone? So what the identity is is different than what creates it, right? So the identity is comprised of segments. It's actually like six core areas that do float in a social, cultural, like in like, you know, kind of like racial identity, right? So who I am here in this country may not fit in a different country, right? But that's just different from who I am as a core. Now, how I build it is actually pretty simple. It's done through just habitual actions. Like you are what you consistently do. We've all heard that. There's great books on it too. Uh, the James Clear is a great book called Atomic Habits. Uh, B.J. Fogg has one called Tiny Habits. They both reference the concept of do it until it becomes who you are. That's, so that's really how you do it. The problem is in our society, no one's thought about, well, what do I choose to do to become the right person? So we'll, we'll grab habits, we'll borrow things, we'll just, I saw so-and-so ate this food and they bought this bicycle to work out and they started a podcast, right? And it's great they're doing these things, but like over time, those things will have you become somebody. 
And if you don't think about the end result, you may do things that leave you at that middle age of like, oh, I don't know, who am I? What do I do? Well, my marriage is falling apart. Well, because you were following Susan's identity at work because she's your boss and she says, do this, you did that. And all of a sudden your life looks like Susan's and Susan don't like her life either, you know? So what I look at is, is it happens through actions, but no, one's, no one went and codified, well, what is, what is identity really? What comprises it? And how can I go back and choose the right habits that will in turn become the person I want? When you, when you identified that making shift happen or shift your identity, when you identified, to, to not, not to be, I didn't, I'm not doing that on purpose, that's just what it is. I get, but it's hard like, to get away It's hard to do it. It's in away. you now. I know. <laughs> but when you identified that, was there a moment, um, and this is more, more of a selfish question because I had this, this kind of moment happen to me, but was there a moment you went, holy crap, this message like resonates so deeply within people because nobody's talking about it. Yeah. Was there a moment when that happened? And if, if so, tell me about what 100%. that felt like. It was, uh, it was in the same time frame because I'm in this room. Uh, so I'm not like a big name dropper, but there's a, it was a phenomenal room I'm in, right? I could say a room, but it was actually in the woods in, in Wyoming. We just got done shooting shotguns for some like skeet shooting stuff. But it, was, uh, it was Brennan Burchard, it was Dean Graciosi, Russell Brunson, Jeff Walker, Lewis Howes, uh, Ethan Willis, Craig Clemens, Dave Hollis, like all these great guys, and we're all sitting there talking. Powerful and so, room. Powerful, powerful room. room, you know? Yeah. And so we're all having this conversation, and Ethan was the guy that had made that statement, and everybody's like, yeah. No, Brennan says, no one's talking about identity right now. I was like, oh, and he's like, that could be a real good like dive in. He says, because the world nowadays, like, that's a big conversation of people don't know who they are, where they fit. He's like, your story's perfect. He says, who else better to talk about it? And then you're like hit with like this, this like, oh, yeah. But here's the interesting thing. And it's with any identity shift, you have this realization of, well, if I take this new thing on, what happens to the old thing? And that was the internal conversation. So the way this business came to be was me pretty much saying like, oh, I'm going to have to get rid of this thing. I've spent time building, right? This person I've spent time creating and create something new. And that's where the scary part takes place. But, but once I realized like, oh, I, I can do it because I've, I've done it before in many parts of my life. I, when you go back and look at any of ours, you as well, you can go, oh, yeah, I've done that. Oh, yeah, I've done that. You'll be like, oh, I've done it already. You just didn't do it with intention. And so for me, like, I was like, oh, this could actually be something that if people understood, and it applies well, it can change lives. Wow, I feel like I should lay down on the couch and just let you ask me some questions because I feel like I could go through, yeah, yeah. you could help me with this <laughs> because I know that when, you know, again, for me, when I, when I decided to exit my business and I didn't sell it, which is kind of my thing, is exit without exiting. Yeah. But when I did that, I had a, that moment of crisis of identity. I, I did not know how to deal with it. And, and you're right, there was nobody, I couldn't turn to anybody to help me through that. I've got coaches and certainly they were very helpful um, because that's what coaches do. But had I known that you existed at that time, I would have reached out to you and said, listen, man, I, you know, I've been this, the CEO of this company that I built, but now I'm not doing that. I'm wanting to go to this other thing, but I'm struggling. So yep. you're helping people with that every single day. So how's your, what's your main way of engaging with people to help them? Is it through public speaking or is it through coaching? How do you do that? You know, all, all the avenues, man. I, I make myself known. So speaking is a big piece of it, right? But then I also do the coaching and then we have corporate stuff we do. It's, it's honestly, we have different channels of, of how we access people. Because the cool thing is, while we do have some niches of individuals we work with, it can touch anybody. Because everybody has an identity, right? That's the end of the day. Anybody can, can benefit from the work but I can't go out to the world and say I help everybody. So realistically, we do best with entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, business owners, those who are realizing like my next level isn't just what I know, but it's who I am with what I know. And, and like there's one part which is crisis, right? That's more of like reactionary. I'm in this moment of like, what do I do? And that's a heavy place for people. The reason most people feel like that when things have changed is because they haven't built another house to live in. I left this house and now I'm like this homeless feeling, but I haven't built this new house to go reside in. I did this thing, I had this piece, and it's like, oh, I left that, oh, where do I go now? And we sit in this, this homeless space as opposed to going and building a new house with skill sets that we already know we have from building this past house. That's one space of it. The other space is, well, I'm here, but I wanna go to a new house. Well, I don't, maybe I don't, I don't leave this house and go homeless, I just build something new, and little by little, I'm just walking out and going to the next house. That's more proactive, like, hey, I want to, um, you know, I want to leave sports and retire and build this new business, right? That can happen, but most guys just retire and it's like, oh, what do I do? I don't know. And we hang out, right? Or I'm going to go ahead and exit without exiting and what am I going to do? I don't know. Right? There wasn't an intention to leave. Wow. And so most people just, they run into those, those really weird purgatories. I think that I didn't realize this, but I think that you and I probably do need to work together because 
so many of the people that I'm talking to in my coaching cohorts, my clients, their 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 aim is they want to exit. Like, yeah. but but they but I'm teaching them this new ways. Like, you don't have to sell your business to do this. You can maintain that business. And and a lot of people like I had a, a, one of my one of my clients, actually a very good friend of mine. He actually asked me, Jason. He said, "Exit to what?" That was his question, which to me at the time was. Like what, to whatever you want to do, man's freedom. Whatever you want to do, what's that next thing? Yeah. But what 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 was behind the question behind the question that I didn't realize until now talking to you is that this is an identity thing, man. It is, man. It's like, hey, I'm the I'm the CEO, founder of X Y Z company, and yes, I do want to exit. There is something else I want to do, but it's clout. I don't know what the hell it is. Like how do and my identity is wrapped up in what I've done for the last decade. How do I get to that next thing? Yeah. So what is your proposition? Do you is is your proposition as a coach? to move that person through that, that shift quicker? Or is it, is it more mindset? Like, t- tell, tell me how yeah, that well, works. The idea is, is first you figure out who you want to be. Because the reality is, is most people don't take into account that what you have isn't, isn't anything more than what you've shown up as consistently. It's created this. So everybody's like, I want to have a new car and have this new thing. And, and I've got to the point of being very clear of like, all right, what's well, great. You have to, it's more than what you know, but it's, it's who you are. Some people have the Midas touch. Anything they touch turns to gold. Why is that? Do they always have the skills or information or everything? No, they just, it's who they were to figure it out. So they figured it out. And so the first thing I look at is, well, who do you want to be at the next level? Then we go back and say, okay, what are we going to do to build into that? And it's pretty, that, it's pretty much that simple. However, the understanding of the depths of it takes steps. Because you have to, in order to build something, you got to know where, you're, where you're, you are right now. And most people, I, I, this is a great statement, is it's hard to see the label when you're inside the jar. Oh, yeah, that's good. So most people don't really know who they are just yet. They've done this thing, and they've built it uh, just haphazardly. And we go, I want to be this person. And then they're like, okay, well, let's, let's go do that. And then some of the stuff they have to do is different. The ego has to get pushed to the side. I got, hey, you're bad at communication. You don't show up very well here. You're a bad dad. You know, like, these could happen. But people don't want to address that. And so when we start looking at what you want to have, you guys start looking at all the parts of who you'll be to have that. And so that journey we go through is, is called the shift method. It's a specific process that takes us through all these stages, but then it gets to the back end. And then here's the beautiful part. You may pause because I'm, I'm talking long. But what happens for me is I get to the point where I realize that we're builders. Entrepreneurs, we, we are happiest in motion. I don't care what I'm doing. i got to be doing something, right? It's just, and so if I'm not doing something, that's where the biggest issue is. It's, like, it's not like, who am I without that? It's like, i got nothing to do. And so if I can give you the, the structure so you can just build in your flow, like the magic's in the motion, the cool thing is you'll get to fall in love with your day again, and it'll turn into, over time, the person you want to be. Oh, that's so good, man. This is, this was, uh, uh, listen, I was excited about you being on the show anyway, but now I'm like, this is, this is gold. People I got, are gonna I got, have to I got a to brain this. in my head, huh? <laughs> this, this is gold. We're going to have to listen to this again. All right, now, so, so we know kind of who you, what you stand for and what your identity is, is helping people move through that. How did, how did you go from, you know, heading into the NFL like you're just going to be, a, you know, a highly paid athlete, you know, doing working out for a living, playing a game for a living. Yeah. So now you have a business. So when did the entrepreneurial, when did that journey start? Yeah, back when I was like 12, 11, 12 years old. So like I, I grew up in foster care. I was given away at three years old. And so I grew up in this really weird environment of just heinous bad people. And then I found out at a young age, if I want to make any money, I'm going to have to make the money myself. So that was always an itch. Went into sports, and then when I got done, I always knew I wanted to run a business. I wanted to run something called Trucks's Trunks, like a like a car stereo business. Trunks's Trunks. Trucks's Trunks. Oh, so How your last name it? and trunk, like where you put the boom box, or <laughs> put, the, put the boom. You put get the, it, yeah. Oh, okay, uh, so it. I always knew I wanted to be in business, but when I got out, man, uh, I my degree was in kinesiology, so I came home, opened a gym. You know, novel idea for an athlete, go to fitness. You know. So I opened this gym, and at nine months in, I was looking at bankruptcy, dude. My marriage was falling apart. I'm saying with a smile. It was not smiley times. But dude, life came tumbling down. Like, I was out of shape. The business was doing horribly. I wasn't a present father. I didn't have my marriage intact. Like, everything was, was out. I couldn't play football anymore. So all that made me me was gone. And I was, in fact, suicidal at one point. Like, man, if this is life after the game, I want no part of this. And... So I was already in business, but like business didn't want me in it, if we'll call it that. I was just kind of out there winging it. And, and to be quite honest, like it was, it was necessary. Like I think business is a microcosm of the world if done properly. So where like sports are a microcosm of human interaction, like if I want to navigate how to interact with different personalities, how to be able to sell myself, communicate well, find value in something, deliver, work, like it's all going to happen in business. And that's why I find the greatest minds are business minds. We solve puzzles all day long. 
And so for me, it was just something where I just, I elevated the level of business that I was doing up from the paper route was the last job I had, you know, to now I'm running this business at a young age and <laughs> it almost broke me, but eventually I strengthened myself through it. So you started the, the gym first and that failed. And then what was the next, what was the next thing after that? The business didn't fail. It almost failed. Oh, it all, okay. It so almost failed. No, it was close. I got to the point of getting landlord eviction letters and I had two weeks to pay four times the amount of money I had or I was going to go in the hole and I hired a coach and I sat with him and it was the first time somebody peeled back the ego because to be honest, football is one part of an ego, but everybody has one. There's positive parts, right? The, the positive part of my ego is like go to practice, lift weights, right? Because I want to be like I'm a football player. That's the good. The bad part was, I don't need any help. I got this, I played in the NFL. And all of us have it. I call it everyone's greatest obstacle, E-G-O. And so a lot of individuals build these inside. And so when it comes time to get the help you need to grow, most of us won't give ourselves permission to improve. So we stay stuck in the same cycle. So for me, I was stuck. And then I hired a guy who broke the ego down and was like, hey, you suck at this. <laughs> I was like, all right. And so I learned to do the things. Here's the interesting thing. I learned to do things that were out of character. Now, when we hear out of character, most of the time we think like, oh, it's bad, out of character. No, no, no. Out of character could also be in the direction of the right character, right? So my out of character was placing phone calls, saying I need some help with this, hiring people, getting more insight, getting more mentors, doing work I was never used to doing because my ego wouldn't let me you know, show myself as being weak. And so out of character was in the right direction of a better character, better identity. And so that was the, the kind of the big catalyst to me being able to be in business still was just tearing everything down and rebuilding back up. So that coach, um, do you still have a relationship with that guy? I don't, no. It was, so, but, uh, but he was yeah. pivotal at that moment to get you broken out of that identity into yeah. something new. Mm -hmm. So the, is, the, is the gym still part of your business uh, portfolio? Sold it in 2018, right before pandemic. Uh -huh. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in California, nonetheless, right? Yeah, man. So, so, you, so you had that business for, when did you start it? 20, actually 20, it was 2008. Yeah, okay, so, so you had it about 10 years. 10 years, yeah. So that's that's a long time in the entrepreneurial world. Most businesses don't last that long. Yeah. So you almost died in it, like the business almost died, not you, but the business almost died in it, although you said you were suicidal at one point. Yeah. You pushed through, coach helped you do that, and you you succeeded. What other businesses have you done besides your current coaching and speaking yeah, yeah. business? What other businesses? So there's always been different revenue streams. I, well, there's one I made. My wife's not a fan of I made something called Love Capsules, which is this interesting physical product <laughs> that I have not marketed or sold at all. It sits in my house and she's pissed, but it's such a cool concept. Um, I may get around that I'm built like this weirdly. I've done things with like t-shirts and apparel. I you just do a bunch to just try and see things, to be quite honest. Uh, but the majority of what I've done has been more revenue streams in the same realm. So like how can I utilize my human skill sets to, to make myself revenue, right? So speaking's always been a big part of it. Coaching's been a big part of it. Sometimes just consulting and dropping in and just doing things. Like I've, our power company here is called PG&E. And so we did like a quarter million dollar contract with them just for teaching them how to stretch and warm up. Like just simple things. And I just, I pounded the pavement. You know, the, the sales cycle's long. It was like a year long sales cycle for corporate. I got in and got paid, but so I've always done different things and it's always been, the idea of like, I absolutely love solving puzzles. And here's, here's what I've now attached my identity to. And there's obviously parts of who I am, but that's what I think the best, most successful people do is I am attached to the effort, not the outcome. So I'm heavily attached to like, did you show up? Did you try? Did you get knocked down? Like, ah, let's go get back up, right? And, that, and I love the outcomes. I, I love the money. I'm not going to lie. I enjoy that. I enjoy the impact I'm making people's lives. That's all great. But I like to get back to the motion. I love the, the energy I get to give. And so for me, it's like I try to find entrepreneurial ventures that allow me to give and do things where I'm just trying, but return to me things that allow my life to be better, which is revenue, free time, all that kind of stuff. So that, I, I've got another guy in my, in my circles of influence who's a podcaster I listen to, and he's a sales, sales guy. He talks about, he coaches sales, and he says, help, he talks about detachment. Mm -hmm. healthy detachment and yeah. what he he doesn't word it the way you did but you said I'm, I'm attached to the effort not the outcome that's in sales that's what a lot of salespeople they get attached to the outcome yeah. and not the process which it, they use the term process you got to be attached to the process you've got to make sure you follow your process so I love that you I love it you're doing that as an entrepreneur because I think as entrepreneurs we get too committed to that outcome that we visualize and yeah. it's okay and what about just it, your strategy just may need to change a little bit. You can still re realize what you want. Strategy's yeah. got to change. You're unhappy the whole time, too. I found that like there's this, uh, I tell people you got to fall in love with the day, not the destination.
because if me and you are traveling to you came here, right? Let's say you're going from you know, Tennessee and you're going to come all the way to California. If you leave your house and the car's late and the flight's delayed and you're sitting next to a baby and it, you could have came to the nicest hotel in the world, you're going to come with a bad mood and you're going to be like, ah, you don't, you don't like it. But if you leave the house, the, you get a limo, they upgraded you, and then you sit next to this amazing man or woman who had a great conversation, and then like you, you land here, have a great meal, and then like they, they upgrade you to first class, baby. You can come here and it, it could be crappy. You'd be like, that's right, I'm still in a good mood. And you'll, you'll let's get a, I'll find a better house. Or do, you'll do that because you're in a better mood. So most people live their day and they just like, they're just, wait, I, I gotta get to the destination and it sucks the whole way they get there. And they get there and it still sucks. So I'm like, well, won't you love the journey and then the destination will be great. And even if it's not, you'll still be happy inside in the process. Yeah, that mindset that you've got about what you're dealing with is so, so important. How would you, how would you define, because this is the root of all success. So how would you define the word success in your own words? What define the word success. Man, I know, I know what I think success is. I don't know if I could define that. That's an interesting thing. I never had anybody ask me to define the word. I think if you looked at the success for me, it would be I have reached a destination or I am, I'm living in a destination, we'll call it, like I like my day, where I don't feel like I'm lacking anything more, which is a weird place to be. Like, because at, at the end of the day, I think that we all have space we want more. But like success, it's always this elusive moving finish line. So I don't know if you actually get to it, attain it. That's a very interesting question. I really like it. It's going to make me go home and think on the drive home. <laughs> How do you define success? I, so for me, success, what I deem success to be is control, which is an open-ended thing. It's not, I think people say freedom, but I don't think freedom is, is like success because I can be free to choose a relationship but feel stuck in this one. I can be free to choose a job, but like I can't move because I, I make this money, I have to do this job, right? So I don't like freedom, but control is a different monster. Whether it's control internally at an emotional level, if I can control my emotions so I can control my actions and control my outcomes, or if it's like I get to just control my day. Because what allows me to have control can vary. Maybe control for me when I'm living in, I don't know, the Philippines, right? On $100,000, like, it's like having $100 million. You know, it's that I can control my life there. So that could be deemed success. But if I'm going off this arbitrary number of success is when I have freedom, it's like, ah, but we're already in the space of freedom. So control, I think, special. That, you know, I ask every person on the show that question. I don't think anybody's ever would use the word control. That is very insightful. And I don't know if you've, it seemed like you just came up with that based on your experience rather than you thought about it ahead of time. I've been asked before. Uh, but, but, I, I, but I love that because I, one of my overarching goals in life is to have complete freedom, to use the term freedom, over my time, energy, and money. And like that, that's, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not backing down from that, but you've just made me think about it. There's a shift happening there in my mindset because it's not just freedom, it's control over it. It's like, and I think that's really, really a good that's good micro content. My editors need to pull that out. That's good. That's good. That's good stuff for you too, man. Well, so now with that in mind, if, if success is control over those things, do you consider yourself to be a successful person? Yeah, man. I can control. I mean, I you, love you, that. you adjusted my schedule. I can drive out here. I can get up in the morning when I want to get up in the morning. I can go to bed when I want to go to bed. I have control of my life. Like I, I operate in a way that allows me to have the right people in the right places where I can say like, I want to do that, or I don't want to do that, or I want to go here, or I don't want to go here. And then at home, man, I can control my, my environment to an extent where I have family, I have a wife that she's a wife, which means she has things she wants me to do them. I'm like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. But like I have control of my emotions in those moments as well, right? I, I have a control of myself and myself in my environment. And, and so for me, yeah, I'm successful, man. But that, that's the thing is, I may talk to a guy who's a billionaire and be like, oh, you aren't successful, you don't have a billion dollars. And the reality for me is like, at the end of the day, like, I'm very happy. I'm very, I'm very at peace, I'm very at ease. Now, do I want more in life? Yeah, but I'm not wanting more, diminishing what I have. I just, I'm at peace. And so it allows me to show up in the world in joy, and then I get to enjoy a world that mirrors back to what I have coming out. Because I think the problem is, when I don't feel like I'm a success, or I don't feel like I have that, we, we get these anxious nerves inside, and then we, we can only give out what we have inside. So that comes out, and the world's a mirror, so it reflects back to you anxiety and nerves and anxiousness. But when you got good in you, because the way you frame up what you see and how you're experiencing life, well, well, good comes out, and the world's a mirror to you. So I get to live in a really cool world because I live internally in a really cool world. 
I love the confidence in that question because because every time I ask it, I'm like, do you consider yourself? You just gave the definition. Do you consider yourself successful? And you know, about half the people are like you, like absolutely, hundred percent, yes. And the other half are like, well, you know, kind of. And but most of them come to the point where they're like. I'm aiming at it, like it's a fluid thing. It's success changes from time to time based on some circumstances, but it's mainly a mindset thing. So I'm glad to hear your confidence yeah. in that. So, well, let me kind of, I'm gonna dig in now because we got really good backstory on where you came from. And I got a couple more backstory detail questions I'm gonna ask, but I'm gonna frame it around the five keys of success. So part of what this show is built on is that, you know, I found myself as an accidental entrepreneur a, de- a little over a decade ago. And I was an unemployed school teacher, ended up starting a business, and I found myself in circles of people like you and that powerful room that you mentioned with all those people, which I want to get back to in a minute. Like I found myself in similar rooms, pinching myself, going, how did I, how did I end up here? Like I shouldn't be here. I was a pastor for 13 years, I was a school teacher for four years, and now I'm sitting in rooms with tremendously successful, financially successful people. And so what I decided to do is just casually start asking questions. How did you do it? How did you become successful? And so I'd have a glass of bourbon or a cigar with somebody or a dinner, and I would just casually ask these people. And what I discovered over time was that their answers on how they became successful all referred back to the same five things over and over and over again. They never used the same, well, sometimes they did, but they didn't often use the same language, but they're all the same concept. So I thought, I bet there's a podcast in this. I bet if I sat down across people from people like you, Anthony, and said, how did you get to success? I think these five things are probably going to show up. So I'm going to see if I'm right. <laughs> I'm going to no, see no, if I'm no, right. Now i got to show up and see if I can Yeah, deliver. and you can disagree. You have complete freedom, no matter what your contract said. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have complete freedom and control over these answers. Yeah. So the, so the first key to success that I found for all entrepreneurs, and I believe and I teach my clients this, is if you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur, specifically as an entrepreneur, now it probably applies in other things as well, but it's passion. That's the absolute number one. And they all start with P, by the way, because I was an old pastor, you know, yeah. pastor in a former life, so I got to make them all alliterate, man. right? Yeah, yeah. So it's passion is the first one. But most people, when I say that, Anthony, they think, okay, I got to be excited and have an emotional attachment to something. Well, that's not really what I mean, although that helps. Like you being passionate about football, passionate about right now, the shift mindset, like the identity, like being passionate about it helps. It's like greasing the wheel. But what I mean by passion and what I found in all these successful entrepreneurs is that passion on the mental side, the word passion actually means willing to endure. So if you think about the passion of the Christ, it wasn't he, he wasn't excited to go to the cross emotionally, but it was a commitment for a greater cause. Yeah. And so I think that every entrepreneur I've sat down with who's super successful had that side of passion. Do you agree that that's been part of your story, or and how would you say yeah, that? Yeah, like, it's almost like an obsession that is, when you're around minds that don't get it, you feel like a crazy person. That's what it is, because if you think about it, if I, I just heard this language you just said now, like willingness to endure. The common person, which, because what we do is uncommon, let's just be honest, start there. The common person talks to me and goes, why in the world do you do that? You have no idea how much you're gonna make next month? No. And do you, like, you could like lose it all if somebody said something bad, get canceled? Yeah. And then like you just get up and you work like how many hours? I'm like, oh, all the time? Are you ever off? <laughs> no? And you just do that? Yeah, how do you do that? Oh man, I don't know. Or if people ask me, how many hours a week do you work? I'm like, probably like 80. They're like, ugh. And I'm like, that tells me more about your job than it tells you about mine. Because the way you frame that tells me how you perceive and project it on. So it, it's like I have had many people, when my business almost went down, my wife and my best friend both said, hey man, you gotta give it up, dude. Just go chalk it up, take the, take the bankruptcy, take the L, go do something else. I'm like, no. I, can't. I don't, I don't know what that exists in my head. I'm like, oh, that's not a reality. Seriously, you could do that? No. I, it was this weird thing. And so what you're calling passion, willingness to endure, 100%, because there's going to be a, a thousand moments you face in a given year that the common mind would be like, that's just too much to keep going. Why, why wouldn't you just logically stop? And it's like, yeah, well, passion is an illogical thing. I can't, I can't put words around why I feel this way, because it just doesn't make sense. But the right person, they, they get it. Like they just, I can just, all I can say is they just get it. People are passionate. I see you. You get it? Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Like, and then you just move on. But those who don't are like, oh, you're crazy. So I would, yeah, I would 100% agree. It's got to be passion and the endurance part of it's a necessity. And you did that, right? Your gym, you were facing bankruptcy. You're facing eviction. And you endured because you could have given up. So oh, easily could have. I, I, the people closest to me told me to. My wife was like, give it up. My best friend, give it up. I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> and so like, then you start getting to the point of, 
if you'll do things, because also as humans, we want to be accepted. We want to be in our circles of friends and our, our human groups are built that way. So to be passionate actually has you go against your common instinctual desires of being accepted by a group and wanting to be like, so typically like the passionate humans are like the crazy people. But the reality is it's like <laughs> those are the ones that get to live in a different space of life later on. Like it's, it's very interesting, but yeah, I, I fully agree, man. Passion is a different monster. Well, I see it happening in your story as you were talking about that. So passion comes true, comes to life in your story. Then the second, the second key is being in the right place at the right time. And I, I and I'm gonna I'm gonna make some assumptions about your story, what I've known about your story from today and when we talked prior to the show, is that growing up in a foster care system, um, although a, a somewhat a negative experience for you, but that was really kind of the right place, right time for you because it led to you today. You wouldn't be Anthony Trucks, the major mega uh, coach and, and speaker today had you not had those experiences. So while that was a negative experience, it was a right place, right time, but it's not the only one. There was the right place, the right time when you got injured, like again, a negative experience, but led you to make the changes in your life where your identity changed and now you're pouring into millions of people worldwide to help them change. And then there are probably other places you can point to that's like, if that place hadn't happened, if I wasn't there at that place at that time, that wouldn't happen. So. Do, do you, what, what do you see about Yeah, you know, place? I think it's, it's interesting. I think I, I agree and disagree. I agree because it is the right place, right time. But at the same time, you have to make it the right place. I love that. That's what it has to be. Because if you think about statistically, I'm, I'm in the 25%-ish of people like that didn't end up in prison, right? Or the 50% who aren't homeless. So, like, they were all in the same place, right? And I, there was no timing difference. It was the same thing. The only difference is what I chose to be the right place. And, and I think there's a statement of no moment has any meaning except the meaning that we give to it. And so like whenever you show up to life and things happen, we're meaning making machines. So if I give a meaning to a moment of this is the reason why I'm gonna you know, get retribution to the world from foster care doing this stuff, like that's the meaning I gave it. That was just the right place, right time, but I chose the wrong meaning. Uh, even it's, it's like when I was sitting in that room with those guys and they go, oh, identity. I could have easily said, ah, oh, you're tripping, I'm gonna stay with this. And then it wouldn't have been the right place, right? So I think all the moments of life, 100%, the right place, right time. There are some that are more of like, you know, I got this information, I found this person out, and I could do that, and then that could be, you know, right? But I think the beautiful thing is you get the opportunity every day to make any moment the right place, the right time. Well, I love what, I love what you said there to clarify that because that's what most people do when they talk to me on this. The show is about you kind of make your right places. You, you're not in control of them. You know, but you are in control of putting yourself in places where that might happen. So you weren't in control of being a foster kid. You weren't in control of getting injured. You weren't in control of, but you did make some decisions that that built on all those experiences that led you to who you are, the successful person you are today. I'm controlling the meaning of it. Because exactly. when you give something meaning, it, it pushes you differently, right? So if the meaning is, like I used to run 40s, when I do 40s for the NFL Combine, and the meaning of, of driving, of running fast was at one point fast time. Got to run a fast time, right? But when I gave it a separate meaning, which sounds odd, but I used to picture my son, I was a dad at the time, I used to picture my son on fire at the end of the 40. So I gotta get there as fast as I can. There's a different meaning to me running, right? So when you've given it a different meaning and you actually, like Michael Jordan's last dance, he used to have to trick his brain, like athletes do that. He, he put it in language I love that I'd never heard or seen, like how they framed it. I was like, oh, we've all done that. But when you play at a high level, you almost trick your mind into giving yourself a meaning that makes you drive. And if somebody really was to unpack it, they'd be like, you're crazy. And I go, yeah, I am. But like, I operate a good flow. But yeah, to be quite honest, like it has to be that same flow of giving it some meaning to be able to make it happen. Well, I love the, I love the right place, right time, kind of pulling that into meaning. The third, the third key that I found in all the entrepreneurs that I've talked to about their success is not only right place, right time, but it's right people. And so I think about your your room that you were in, and which person was it that told you that identity? No, but who was it that said Ethan that? Willis. He's so a, Ethan. Yeah. So I don't know Ethan. Like I, the, some of the He's other names, dude. I know, but I don't know Ethan. guys. I know, man. But but yeah. I think that, like, and I probably I'd not, I I need to know Ethan. I need to know all those guys in that room. But like I I think that might maybe he among uh, many others probably people that you have not revealed yet were right people. I want to also talk about your coach, like your coach that when you're almost bankrupt with the gym, mm -hmm. like your coach came in and tore down your ego, like yep. he was also that right person. So what what do you think? Or is, is my assumption correct that you had a few right people that helped to make you successful? At every level of life, from foster care to sports to everything, there's uh, 
there's this, I think the thing with human beings is like we always have these bubbles that we sit into internally and like we think we got the answers. But there's that same thing as you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know, you don't know it, right? And everybody lives in this world of like, oh, I know. No, you don't. Like, you don't. <laughs> and I don't. I, I tell my kids all the time, like, I am not infallible, man. There's a lot that I don't know I don't know. But I also realize that in that, that conversation, the fastest way, almost the only way to find it out is you do trial and error or you talk to people who've done the trial and error. Like, I think every day, like, it's weird. I drive in my car, and I'm like, there are thousands of stories passing me every day that are, are probably gold for my life, but I'll never have the conversation. So I'm in elevators, or I'm in doctor's offices. I talk to people. My wife hates it. She, she's like, what are you talking to people? Because like, I want to know something that I didn't know that before I walked in, right? But that's the thing, is I've realized that people hold the key to all the success we want. And, and too many people are fearful of feeling embarrassed around a person for not knowing what they know. So, like, I just don't. I don't, I'm not embarrassed. Like, I don't know. Why would I know? So I'm asking, like, oh, cool. Take it, add to my repertoire, and now I can move on with my life a little bit better. So you just said people hold the key to all the success we want. And that's why people is so important in this key to success is that, you know, for people listening to this show, whether they're fans of yours listening or they're fans of mine or they're just happenstance to be listening to the show, is that I want them to know that they are one relationship away from a totally different life. Man, one person out there could change your life forever. And that's negative and positive. That's how my life, that's how I'm here. Dude, the, the, so this whole world, I was in the fitness space. I was meeting, like, I was doing this consulting for a company for, for fire department stuff, right? And then the guy says, hey, we're going to film some videos and put them online. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, that's magic. That's, you don't do that. He's like, no, we're going to do it. The guy said, Jadon Cherry. I go, Jadon, you're crazy. He goes, no, this guy, Brendan Burchard, does that. I'm like, who? And he so he gave me a link to this guy's Experts Academy thing. And I live an hour from the event. I go to the event. And next thing I know, I'm up there clapping hands. I'm like, yeah, I can do something speaking wise. And then sure enough, Life progresses on to where I, they ask me to volunteer. I get to know him. And like just that human being existing has changed my entire life. That is amazing. I lo- and I hope that people pay really close attention to that because this passion, this willingness to endure, being in the right place at the right time, and putting yourself, like you went to that conference. I did. I didn't have to. You didn't have to go. There. You put yourself in the right place at the right time, and you met that right person, and everything changed because of your success hinges on that. Well, the fourth, the fourth key to success that I found is preparation. And preparation really is the know-how to pull it off. Yeah. And the preparation is such as this weird thing, like some people are prepared through, you know, the college and degrees and they learn. Other people are prepared through life experiences. It sounds to me like most most of your preparation was through life experiences. Oh, yeah, is, that, is that right? Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's a statement I love and it's, uh, I think it's a quote and it says, a smooth sea makes not a skilled sailor. So like for me, like you said, all the stuff that happened as a kid, like I don't like it, but I appreciate it because it did give me a wealth of understanding and knowledge and like people skills and the ability like to navigate certain situations that if I wasn't in that that experience, I would have never got the skill sets. It's kind of like saying I want to be strong without going into the weight room, right? Life just gave me a bunch of weights so I could actually build a strength to be able to go out to the world later on and compete. And so for me, 100%, it's like that preparation has been a necessity, but also there's, that's like reactive. I do proactive also. I put myself in situations that are super uncomfortable or I, I navigate my day a specific way so people like, they can't just, you know, get into my day and mess up my dreams. But preparation, if you don't have that, you'll just be, you'll be getting up and hoping that your energy you have today will drive you to the destination. And that's a problem because what happens is at some point you're gonna wake up and not have the energy. And it's very easy to talk just you out of that position to go do something else. So you bounce around shiny object syndrome because no one's prepared and no one stays the path and it's just a, it's a conundrum sometimes. Do you, you know, I don't know why this thought just came to me, but do you, do you speak or do you have opportunity to speak to groups of foster kids in the system? A lot. So yeah. how, does that, how does that go for you? Like, is that, do you get a Very good well. response? Very, the thing is, a lot of those kids, like no one comes back who's been in foster care. There's not as many people that come out and are successful at a world scale. And then those who do, we usually don't tell our stories the way I tell it because most of the time there's a shame behind it. Like, you know, I, I wasn't good enough, my mom didn't love me, or just the pro- problems, things that happen as a kid. So most of the time it's the shameful behind the scenes nobody hears about kind of thing, but there's so many of us, right? And I think for me, like the, the ability to go out and talk about it's been a massive difference, so I do it a lot. You won't see it on social. It's not done for me to like, hey, look at me world. Majority of the time, it's done for that demographic, for those kids and for my heart. So yeah, I do a lot of it, but you ask the question because you don't see it, because I don't want you to see it. Yeah, well, I was just thinking about, like, I, my wife and I were foster parents. 
And uh, we, had, we had some good experiences and we had some bad experiences, but I know that that system is so broken and, yeah. and it's, it's, not, it's not the kid's fault. They, don't, they deserve better than that, but they're getting as best that, that the system can provide. You know? But if they can hear and look to somebody like you who's super successful, because I think, <clears throat> I think too many of us, and I know that you, you would probably agree with this, is that there's this, this victim mentality, which is an identity problem, this victim mentality, these foster kids growing up like, hey, man, I'm going to age out of the system. Nobody loved me. I got pissed around, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just a loser. And then they end up doing drugs and they, you know, maybe homeless. They end up in prison. But that's not an excuse. Like, no, man. And it's not honest, an excuse. I tell these kids, and this is for anybody, you don't have to have gone through foster care to get this lesson. At the end of the day, it's a superpower, man. Because I find there's a lot of adults I'm around nowadays and things happen and all hell breaks loose for them. And they have a ton of responsibilities. They got a mortgage, they got a marriage, they got kids, they got bills, all stuff. And they fall apart and everything comes tumbling down. And the biggest reason is because it's the first time they face true hardship. And so for me, it's like, man, I faced true hardship as a kid because the biggest issue is the emotional. If, I'm, if, my, if I can't control my emotions in the middle of a tornado, like I, I fall apart, I shut down, I tuck away, I get angry, I push people away, right, because my emotions are off. I dealt with that when I was like three to 14 and then beyond, right? I've been in that for a long time, so I have that skill set. And while I did it younger, some people, they have had it in 20s, they had it in their 30s. They've had those moments, but they're looking at them as if they were detrimental or negative or shameful. And I'm like, no, man, those are the weights. Like, you, you've survived 100% of those days. You get a ton of strength. Lean into that as opposed to make an excuse of why you can check out. Make it the reason why you do well. And, man, life has lived much better. And I, I, I don't know, how, how long have you been doing that for the, to speak of foster kids, how many oh, years? Oh, as just as I can, man. I started out with like juvenile halls back in like probably t when I was talking, 2010, 11. I started just little by little built up and then, yeah, we do a lot. Cost or I sit in the board of an organization called National Angels. So I do a lot, but it's just not, it's not a prominent push to the world. Now there's discussion of like, well, maybe you should do more of it so the world sees more of it. But I don't want it to be something where people go, oh, the foster guy doing stuff for the foster kids, let's help them out of pity, if it makes sense. Because I do feel like I walk in a room sometimes and they hear the story and they like, it's almost like a pity feel. And I'm like, I don't think you get it. I'm a monster, bro. Like, I will outdo you in your world. Like, it's not, that's not a, I don't see it as a sad part for me. That's a, that's a straight, that's an asset to me now. So I don't push out to the world as much, but I do a ton for the organizations that need me. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I think that's, that's the true kingdom work for, for those of us that follow Jesus, like our king, the kingdom that he's building. And I love that you're doing that because those kids deserve it and they need it. And I'm also, uh, I asked the question, so you didn't come out and talk about it, but I, I wanted to know what, the, what was going on there. And I appreciate the humility behind keep, kind of keeping that on the down low because that's not why you're doing it. And there's so many people that do that, and the only reason they're doing it is because they get props for it. So. Yeah, I mean, it's positive. So it's, there's some benefit in doing it, just it's not for me. Yeah. But yeah. So the fifth, the fifth key to success, and, and uh, this one I know you believe in because I heard you on your live before we went on there. You were talking, you used the word plan. Damn so there. plan, this thing, this thing is like, what's your strategy to make this thing happen is one of the keys to success. And it doesn't mean a written business plan. Like I, I, out of all the people I've ever interviewed who, who are super successful entrepreneurs financially, I would say probably less than 30% had a written business plan. So that's not the indicator for success. Like, so congratulations, you wrote a 32 page business plan so that your banker would give you money. That's not an indicator of success. But what a plan really is, like, how are you going to execute this thing? Hope is not the driving factor. Like, like it'll, it'll keep you motivated for a little while, but it won't make you successful. So what was your plan to make all this work so you would be successful? So we did a plan years ago when I first had a business. I was like, I got to do a plan. And I realized like it's pointless because the plan is, it doesn't, you don't even use it most of the time. That's that sounds right. good, right? I think that the thing for me is planning is the only way I operate smooth. Like, I ha I'm good at showing up and doing the work. Like, like, when I played football, coach had a plan for the day, game plan for practice. I just showed up and I could put my energy into it. And when you leave the game, you don't have that. And that was the biggest hindrance for me is like, how do I succeed? I don't have, no one's writing my plan for my life. So to learn how to do it for myself. And so when I learned to do it, then I could show back up and go to work. And so you're right, like the, the plan is the most amazing piece because if it's in place, I can run fast without question. I'm not worried about whether it's the right place or the wrong place, or I'm going the wrong direction. So for me, when I think about plan, it's like, I need to be able to operate in a flow of just sheer instinct and just flow, but I have to have spent time creating in advance. So it's almost like a, like a like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. 
I'll sit back and I'll plan my days and my weeks, and I'm four weeks out from my life at all times. But that thing allows me to say, okay, those are my guardrails. Now when I show up to the day, I sprint. And then I can do it without getting drained emotionally, without getting burned out, because I'm like, I'm doing it. But I also have a plan of like, how do I keep boundaries? How do I keep, like, how do I keep the outside things out, inside things in? Um, how do I check the plan? How do I just, how do you navigate and make adjustments periodically? But dude, without that plan, you are literally running yourself into a wall. It's, it's, it's almost inevitable. I've, I've coached many people. A lot of what I do is planning for the identity. So how are you going to become that person in any way without a plan in place? Because here's the thing, you'll wake up and you'll just go off your feeling. And for me, what I've come to realize is I've kind of got through all this. This is the, the statement you got to anchor with is my life needs to tell me what to do today. That's it. My business has to tell me what to do, because if not, it's not a business. It's you doing things. My life has to tell me what to do today, or I'm not going to be a good dad or a good husband or a good coach, right? My, I have to have a plan in place in front of me that's telling me how to live in line with what I planned. And if I get up and I'm the one in charge of that, I will at some point ruin it, because I won't feel like it. I'll be too tired, whatever it may be. But if that's the plan in place, I show up and do that, I may not feel like doing it today, but it's going to get done. And then it does, and I feel like more of that person. I get more of the success. So I, I love that your story incorporates all five of these keys to success, but what, what else, is there some other key to success that you don't see that attaches to one of those five keys? Peace. That, peace? Oh, I got a six P. Peace, man. <laughs> so what's that mean? Man, for me, everything I do has to operate in a sense of like, I'm a football guy, right? We weren't, peace wasn't part of my life. It's just, it's chaos. And you, you understand to operate in it. But for me, the ability for me to be here and have levity and be in joy with, I got stuff going on and everybody has stuff going on, but like I got peace, man. When you have that, it allows you to do the work necessary to endure at a level. I, I don't think enough people have or seek or create peace for themselves. And that I think is, is a testament to them only being happy at the destination. Because I am in love with my day. I love meeting new people. I, you guys love hanging out, like just doing this. Uh, I, I love the idea of driving my car and listening to music. I, have this, I got to listen to some songs I've been wanting to listen to for a while that I haven't had a chance to, or audio books. Like, I love it. I find ways to create joy in moments most people would not like. And so because I do that, I'm creating peace actively. Therefore, when I show up to my days, I'm doing things in joy so they don't drain me. So I, I'm actually filling my cup as I pour it out. And that's a space that I find like the most successful humans I've met and my version of success who are in control those people got peace. I love that. I love that a lot. You said you listen to audiobooks. So you, speaking of books, you've got a book coming out, yeah. Identity Shift book. So talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so all the stuff I talk about is all great concept. But I'm a big process guy. I think like the whole football thing taught me like everything's got to have a plan, that audibles and adjustments. So we created what's called the Shift Method years ago. It was a process where I could take all the ideas out of my head and then have people go through them and actually get the result we're talking about, right? So it's... People, may, they make more money. I've had guys make a million dollars doing it. Like, generally, not from the aspect of the business, but becoming the person who could apply the tools they, they knew to apply. People lose a bunch of weight, fix marriages. It's very cool what happens on the back end of it. And previously, the only way to access it was a, to go with my coaching programs. Because I can tell you on a stage how to do it, but you really want to do it, you got to kind of go into a coaching program. So I was like, what if I just put in a book? And it wasn't even a full, it was actually, I'd been writing it slowly and a publisher came along and like, kind of like, hey, it's time to put this book out. So the book was one where it's the process, but also the concept. I needed people to understand why identity is so important. So the book breaks down the concept so you go, oh, wow, I didn't really get how important this was. And then now that you get it, here's how you do it. And the second half is all process and the shift method. All right, so the book is coming out as of today when we're recording. It's not out yet, but it's coming. And you got a special offer for listeners to The Root of All Success. So they can go to identityshiftbook.com. Yep. And if they use the code ROOT, as in Root of All Success, what do they get? You get some cool stuff. So for me, uh, I wanted to give a lot of it. Because, again, this is not like I'm not an author. I'm not J.K. Rowling. My money isn't made in writing books, right? So I was like, I want to give as much as I can. So you go to that website, you get the book, put the code in, and then what happens is I'll send for free the audio book, because I'm an audio book guy. So if you want to hear my voice talk it through it, I'll do that. Uh, there's also a digital book for those people who want to like put it into their Kindle and read it that way. And then what I did is I made a workbook. And the workbook's the most important part for me that I think is the most beneficial to people, because what you read, it's like, great, I read that, but we'll read and we'll move on. And then you only retain a small percentage of it. The biggest thing is called increasing cognitive rigor. So I made a workbook that takes the stuff from the book and puts it into a place you can work through it 
So you actually ingrain it, you do the work, and you actually see it show up in your life. Mm -hmm. So identityshiftbook.com, use the code ROOT, and you can get access to Anthony Truck's new book, Identity Shift. And uh, I, 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 I mean, I want to get it because I think- I got a copy for you. <laughs> well, that's awesome because I, I mean, I knew this is what you did, but this is why I do these shows, man. It's like I get to sit across, uh, and it's like I get to sit across from you, man, and you get to tell me this stuff, and I think, man, I, how blessed am I to get to meet people like you and sit down and have this conversation? That, so thank you for that. Welcome, man. I, I want to I ask you this one final question, and this is for the benefit of the listeners. So the listeners to the show are usually entrepreneurs or they want to be entrepreneurs. They're trying to figure out how to get there or... They've, they've, they've considered it, but they've got a nine to five. They're okay with it. But like that person who has not yet made that decision to shift, to mm -hmm. use your, your phrasing, to shift into that mode of entrepreneur, what advice would you give to him or her? Man, uh, well, first off, get around people that are like us. Because the, the biggest thing that I found people who don't want to like step in is like there's still a space of unknown. And so people's a big piece, right? If you get around the right minds, They'll tell you ways to go do it. They, they're not going to be like, just go do it, figure it out. They don't always. They'll give you like, oh, that, go try this, call this person, say this. And it's like that one little bridge, one little bridge. If you get around the wrong people, they'll talk you out of it. They'll play to the side where you already want to be, which is safe, right? And so if you want to step into that space, get around the right people. And then the biggest thing, man, is it's, uh, it's kind of like this thing where you kind of have to build it slowly. Like if you're in that in-between, it's the same thing as the house. You have your career, you have your nine to five, you have your job, you've built that house. You don't want to be homeless. You might literally be homeless that way, right? The idea is to say, how can I build something in that separate time? Because nowadays, you could build anything. I was watching a, a Netflix documentary about a guy who became a kingpin in the drug world in his childhood bedroom. You know, like, it's, you can do anything nowadays. So build it slow. And then what I tell people is, is build it towards making revenue. And it's doing what it needs to do to where the only factor of what it needs more to grow is time. So when it, when it becomes time, there's systems in place, it's process, it's running. When the only thing you know it needs to scale is time, then you can make that jump. Because now you're taking the time given here to the time here, and this will actually turn into more revenue later on. But if you do it right, get the right people in your, in your kind of pocket and then build slowly, let your current job invest in your future business, man, then you have something special to build. Anything you want to kind of leave, just final parting thoughts to the listeners about your success and how you got there? My success and how I got there, man. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's literally too many things. I think at the end of the day, it's, it's the human relationships I have. To be quite honest, those are the things that matter the most. My marriage, which we even cover a lot of that, but we were high school sweethearts, had three kids, divorced, remarried, have an amazing marriage now. Uh, I have kids that I love. I have great friends. Like the, the relationships in my life, everything that I've ever accomplished has always been the greatest because I got to share with those people. And at the same time, and all the hardest things were, were because of those people. It's weird how it works out, but when you focus on the relationships in life, everything else comes to pass positively. In my experience, when I was in the down and outs, I borrowed joy from people. I go around them to just hang out because I feel better about myself. When, when I was you know, in Toronto, I was doing really well. I felt better because I could give back in different ways, right? So it's just the dynamics of human relationship. That's why, we're, that's why we can do this. Yeah. I can actually make vibrational noises that your brain is getting. And we're having, you know, I'm like, this is what we're made to do. And so many people, they lose sight of that. And then everything else is a means to their internal end. But really, it's this. Well, you know, I told you that was going to, that was the last question. But what you just said made me remember, I forgot to ask you, how did you get into that room with those guys? That was a powerful yeah. <laughs> room. Like, how did you get in there with those guys to yeah. even have that conversation that shifted your identity. Yeah, it was uh, relationships, man. It's a great ending to it. That's, guess, what, right? that's what made me think of it because you were talking so, about relationships. So I was in that room, and it's, just, it's the real roundabout way. In the room, in the back of the room, I'm having this conversation. He makes you break. You get in groups and tell your story. So I get in a group tell my story. There's a girl in the group named Cammie, and Cammie didn't know who she was. No, I, I, just, I know her name because of this reason. So later on, I'm in the hallway walking. Some lady stops me. She says, tell me your story, right? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm happy to say, here's my story. I tell her my story. Cool. She walks away. I hear nothing of it. I went to like two more events, and then later on, someone goes, hey, do you want to volunteer? And I go, yeah, but why would you ask? They go, well, the first time you were here, Cammie, who happens to be the, the fiancé of a guy named Jeremy, Jeremy is Mel's son. Mel is Brendan's security, right-hand guy. Like, he's at every event with him for the last 15 years. And so I was like, yeah, I'll come volunteer. So I went and volunteered because I heard this cool story. She could have been in any other group, was in my group, you know what I mean? So I'm there, and I'm hanging out, and I'm doing my thing, and I'm just there to show up and volunteer. Well, little by little, like, hey, do you mind, like, you know, take Brendan back to his room? So I talked to Brendan, meet him, you know, a little briefly, and then 
over time, we get to just kind of talk. I'm volunteering at events. And then he's like, hey, um, you need anything like you have anything fitness wise? I had this thing called Gym in a Bag. I was like, yeah, I got this thing I made when I was doing my fitness stuff. He goes, let's make it. So we make this thing called High Performance Workout. It's a gym in a bag. And so we made this whole thing, and then we ended up selling it together. And the more I got to talk to him, the more he realized there's a deeper story than just fitness for me. And so it turned into him inviting me along to his mastermind with the groups of guys. And then it's just turned into some crazy cool connections over the years. And I spoke on his stage. And I've earned every stage of my stuff, that makes sense. Like, I had to get skill sets and develop and build, because that guy ain't put you in front of his people if you ain't dope, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, but that was it, and all it was, to be quite honest, I've never, I've never shown up trying to get something. I've tried, like, how can I give? How can I serve as people, serve as environment? How can I serve the, anybody? I just, I, I, if you give, the world recipro like it reciprocates. You get things back in return. I love it, man. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. This has been an honor to talk to you and hear your story. I appreciate you driving here today and being a part of this. And uh, I, I know that what you've said is inspirational to people out there. It is to me. And I want to I want to do more with you. I want to I want to dive into your world a little bit and get to know you. Maybe we can do some stuff in the future together. Never know, so, man. Thank you. Thank Very you. welcome. Well, there you have it, guys. This is another uh, example of these five keys of success and how they show up in people's lives. And you can access your success using those same keys. Those keys unlock the door the same way they would unlock the door to this Airbnb or the door to your car. Like the keys, if you use them properly, will get you where you want to go. And so these keys of passion and right place, right time, knowing the right people, preparation and plan can be yours. You can use those keys. Now, one of the things that Anthony talked about is how imperative it was and how, um, how, how it shifted his identity and shifted his life by having that coach that helped him see things differently. And I love the analogy he used, like you can't see the label when you're in the jar. So it got him out of the jar. Having a coach got him out of the jar so he could turn around and look and go, oh, well, you know, there are things in my ego that need to be broken down so I can get to the next level. If you would like a free coaching session with me, I do one free session every single week. And I do this because I truly believe that entrepreneurs are the ones that change the world. And so, of course, just like Anthony, I do high ticket coaching, I do group coaching, I do some one on ones, and I do I do some speaking. But but one of the ways that I give back is I just do this one free session a week, and I only do one a week, and it's one person. It's the real Jason Duncan with a real entrepreneur working through a real issue. So we go through one real issue. And if you want access to that, you can sign up for your free session at therealjasonduncan.com/slash free coaching. So go to therealjasonduncan.com slash free coaching. My team takes a look at all the people that send in that application every week and we pick one person and he or she, no matter who they are around the world, we spend that one session with, with could be you going through one issue to get you to that next level. Thank you for tuning in for the Root of All Success. It's been my pleasure to host Anthony Trucks here today. Go look him up. You can find him on Instagram and LinkedIn, Anthony Trucks. Anthony Trucks, T-R-U-C-K-S, just like the truck, just like a truck. So Anthony Trucks, just look him up on Instagram. He's got some great video content. I, I have envy over his uh, his setup in his studio when he does his videos. It's, it's fantastic. It looks so great. So go find him there. I will see you next time when we get together to talk to another super successful entrepreneur about his or her journey to success. I'm the real Jason Duncan. And until next time, remember, Jesus is King. Thank you for listening to another edition of The Root of All Success with The Real Jason Duncan. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, we invite you to visit therootofallsuccess.com to access the show notes and other helpful resources. Take charge of your business. Grow it from great to incredible. Join us again next time here on The Root of All Success. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.